can hear me all right? Fantastic, okay. Thanks very much for the introduction and, and thanks uh, for the invitation also. It's really a great pleasure to be able to speak here. Um, so this course will be a short course, so there's only three lectures. And the main purpose is to give an introduction to the foundations of the theory of rigid co-cycles and its use uh, to give an attempted construction of singular moduli for real quadratic fields. Now, uh, this theory hasn't been around for that long, only a couple of years. And uh, what I'll do here is I'll give a sort of friendly introduction to the foundations of the theory, which can really be made very elementary and very computational as well. Now, this is in sharp contrast with the increasing number of theoretical results that are emerging also in this area, um, which, in contrast, have kind of formidable prerequisites uh, to appearing in their proofs, and in particular the proofs of uh, special cases of some of the observations that we're about to make in this course. So instead, we'll take a very kind of elementary and computational approach in this course, the main idea, of course, being to embody as much as possible the spirit of this summer school, which is number theory informed by computation and I very much hope to make it sufficiently concrete and computational for you to apply everything that you've learned so far in this summer school all your skills with your favorite computer algebra system and really uh, engage with this theory in a very concrete and examples based way uh, to help you do that, there's a, a series of exercises which you can find online and we have a problem session, first problem session later today. Uh, so the official TA for that is James Rickards, I don't know if he's around, if you can raise your hand, yeah there he is. Uh, he'll be leading those sessions. There's also my student Horvath Dunn Johnson who uh, knows a fair deal about these computations that go uh, into it. Uh, is, is he here? I don't know. Oh, there he is, yeah. So uh, those two people will be around and you can ask them lots of questions and I'll be around also. I encourage you to do so. Okay, um, I think that should cover the practical side of things. If there are any questions, uh, please interrupt me. So today will be mostly motivational and including also some very classical background. And on Thursday and Friday, I will start in earnest with the rigid co-cycles. And I would like to begin today by discussing the first two words here in the subtitle, which is singular moduli. These boards really vibrate a lot. Huh? Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, okay, so the values of the modular J function, which has appeared many times already, I think, in other courses, which I'll call Klein's J invariant, which is defined by a very explicit Q expansion. This is n cubed q to the n divided by 1 minus q to the n, where n is greater than or equal to 1. You'll recognize the Eisenstein series of weight 4 here, and I'll cube it and divide it out by the following infinite product, which defines the Ramanujan delta function. And if you expand this out as a q series, you obtain 1 over q plus 744 plus this magical number 196. 884q, etc. And I can view this as a function on the Poincare upper half plane, the variable q being e to the 2 pi i tau. The sentence starts with the values. And I'll be interested in very specific values, namely those values of tau in the upper half plane, which satisfy a quadratic equation with integer coefficients. These are called CM points. So these are points in the Poincaré upper half plane, which I'll denote by age sub infinity, which is just the set of all complex numbers whose imaginary part is positive. So what about these values? I'll claim that they are arithmetically rich. is not a mathematically very precise term. So let me try and point out a number of ways in which they are arithmetically rich, perhaps guided by a few basic examples, uh, most of which, I mean the most standard ones, 
or if you start by evaluating the j function at i, square root of minus one, there's a unique such square root in the upper half plane, you get the number 1728. It's appeared in many talks already, as well as the j invariant of a cube root of unity, which is zero. Perhaps a slightly more interesting randomly chosen example is the j function evaluated at the square root of minus 15. Now I have to look at my notes, which I computed for you. It's minus 5 squared times 3 cubed times this magnificent number, 637 plus 283 square root of 5 divided out by twice the square root of 5. Okay? Minus 15, sorry, this is not very clear. Thank you. Minus 15, exactly. Now there's two things I'll note about this number. Well, it's an algebraic number. It's an algebraic number that's defined over a different field than the argument that we fed into the J function. What that field is, I'll tell you in a second, and you probably already know. But I would like to point out two things. The first is that we can compute its norm. It's an algebraic number. We can factorize that norm. What we get is minus 3 to the power 6, 5 cubed, 11 cubed. This is a cube. So we obtain an integer. That's an algebraic integer. If we take its norm, we get an honest, rational integer. And if you factorize it, we find that it's extremely smooth. It's divisible only by very small prime numbers. Uh, to some large exponents. I'll also mention, because it will come back potentially later, that it also has a trace. And that trace, well, you can kind of read it off from this, I guess. It's minus 3 cubed, 5 squared times 283, which happens to be a prime number. Okay? I'll get back to these two observations and why I bother telling you this about this particular J value. Now, classically, the reason people were very interested in these J invariants Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a tendency to write very small, so please don't hesitate to remind me if I uh, exhibit some recidivism. So classically, and I'm talking now sort of late 19th century, they were notable because of their ability to generate ring class fields of imaginary quadratic fields. And class field theory was in full development in those days. Putting the singular moduli really center stage um, around the turn of that century. In this particular example, the relevant ring class field is just the Hilbert class field. For the imaginary quadratic field, Q joined the square root of minus 15, which is the field of definition of the argument that we plugged into the J function, and out came this number, which is contained in the Hilbert class field. which in this case is, uh, is a genus field. It's a biquadratic field obtained by joining the square root of minus 3 and the square root of 5. Indeed, it generates that field over the imaginary quadratic field, um, the singular modulus does. So this is classically why people were very interested in these singular moduli. And uh, for a long time, I think, certainly up to and including World War II, they, people had the feeling that this theory was really satisfactorily concluded. Now, a huge renaissance for singular moduli happened much later. And this came with the uh, very celebrated work of Gross and Zagier. Their first paper together dates from 1985. And what they did is something that looks very strange at first sight. They say, take one singular modulus, j tau 1, 
that gives you such an interesting algebraic number that is uh, a generator for a ring class field. And now let's take another one of a discriminant that has nothing to do with the first one. Yeah? So j tau 1 minus j tau 2, where the discriminant of tau 1 is less than 0, and the discriminant of tau 2 is also less than 0. And in the paper of Gross and Zagier, the original paper, they required that these were co-prime and fundamental. What they did is, this is an algebraic number, an algebraic integer. So you can take its norm, and that gives you an honest integer. And what they do in their paper is they give an explicit formula for what this integer is. Looks a little bit bizarre at first sight, but what is so fantastic about this discovery is that it led to really deep and very important developments. And the foundations of these discoveries I mean, if there's anything that screams the theme of this conference, I think it's very much the, the origins of this work of Gross and Zagier. And uh, fortunately, Zagier had some um, significant birthday, I forget which one, a couple of years ago. And uh, Dick Gross gave a talk on the occasion of this birthday, and he made public also the letter that he received from Zagier in 1983, announcing some of these first discoveries. And this is such a wonderful document. So Gross says the following, he says, uh, singular moduli were studied intensively by the leading number theorist of the 19th century, as we remarked. Their algebraic integers, which generate certain abelian extensions of the imaginary quadratic fields. The theory was believed to have been brought to a very satisfying completion in the early 20th century. That was before Don got his hands on it. In early 1983, Don sent me an amazing letter from Japan containing a proof of a factorization formula for the integer which is the norm of the difference of two singular moduli of relatively prime discriminants. This was a completely new aspect of the theory, which Don had discovered by extensive numerical experimentation. So that's very much in the spirit of this conference. And here you can see uh, this letter. It's very nice. I recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to, to look at it. It's really fun to read. Uh, and I'll read sort of the first page of it, and uh, you'll see in the exercises, the first exercise really is to try and recreate for yourself this moment of doing these numerical calculations and to actually spot some of the patterns without looking at the letter first and try and relive this moment, which seems like a very frivolous exercise. It's very ill-defined, uh, trying to find patterns and see if they match up with patterns that someone else found 40 years ago. But it's very instructive because later on in the third lecture, we'll do precisely that, but in the setting of real quadratic fields. And we'll try and mimic as much as possible that initial process of being guided by computations. So this is what Zagier writes. Dick, he says. I've been in Japan for two weeks now, and I'm enjoying it tremendously, both for sightseeing and mathematics. However, telling you about the trip can wait till you get to Germany. I'm writing now for mathematical reasons only. Um, yes. As you may remember, I had asked you whether our results might be generalized to results on the norm of the difference of singular moduli for arbitrary CM points, tau 1 and tau 2, with unrelated discriminants. You poo pooed the idea, explaining why your method only applies to uh, two elliptic curves having CM by the same order. Not daunted, actually I was, I didn't do the calculations till now, I calculated the difference of singular moduli for many different examples of class number one. A somewhat tricky business, since my HP has only 10 places. And I found the values, and then he has a big table. Now already, I am just mesmerized by this letter, because, I don't know, I wasn't born, but in 1983, if you were going on a trip to Japan, I don't think people had laptops, so this HP with the 10 places he's talking about, I could only surmise he's talking about a, a calculator with sort of 10, I don't know, eh, but uh, this to me is, this is amazing, that he had a calculator with 10 places and worked out all of these tables. You have one? Fantastic, okay. So if you really want to be hardcore, you should do the first exercise for this course with only that HP. <laughs> That's for the really hardcore people. Other people can use a laptop, uh, and that also makes the exercise, I think, quite a bit more palatable, because it doesn't sound like the most fun uh, obstruction to put yourself uh, under. Okay, now I want to highlight one table. 
So Zagier computes many things in this letter. And I'll just, uh, I'll just pick out sort of one example that we can stare at and try and explore a little bit together. It's the j value at 1 plus square root of minus 7 over 2. And I'll subtract the j invariant of 1 plus the square root of minus 43 over 2. Now, CM theory tells us that these are both integers. Right? So the norm is not necessary. It's already an integer. And that integer, when you factorize it, is 3 to the 6 plus 5 cubed so times 5 cubed, rather, times 7, times 19, times 73. Okay? Again, very smooth number, which is quite remarkable because the J invariants themselves, as we already noted here, maybe this norm, they tend to be very smooth themselves. So we have the difference of two smooth integers, which is again very smooth. The ABC conjecture tells us that that sort of stuff shouldn't happen very often. Uh, luckily, there's only a finite number of examples here, so we can still believe in ABC if we want to. Now, this is, this is what Zagier does, is he makes a little table. And here, I mean, of course, he had some foresight. So this is the part that will seem a little bit strange. Uh, but he had good reasons to be interested in those particular expressions. So what he's going to do is he's going to take x to be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Uh, that's probably enough. And then let's, let's make another one here. x going this time from 11, 13, 15, and 17. Okay? Now the expressions that he's going to compute for each of those x is the following. So it's 7 times 43, which is the product of the two discriminants of the CM points that we plug in, minus 7 and minus 43. But that's the same. You subtract x squared and you divide it by 4. And he's going to list all of the positive integers that are of that form. Right? So this can only happen for odd x's in this range. Yeah? So those are the only examples where this expression is a positive integer. So he computes those. So for instance, here we get 7 times 43, which is 301 minus 1 squared, which is 300, divided by 4, which is 75. Okay, so 75 is 3 times 5 squared. I'll just fill in the table, and you look at the numbers and see if you notice anything suspicious. This is a table. Okay, who's willing to make a conjecture? Observation zero. Every prime factor that arises, so that divides the difference of these two singular moduli, seems to arise somewhere in this table. Correct? Good. That seems to be true. Now, conversely, that's not such a hot statement, it seems. Some of the prime factors that appear in this table do not appear on the left. Oh, so there's something wrong. Uh, because I probably made a horrendous mistake. 3 squared 5. Thank you. Yeah, this is a problem with uh, a board talk. And for this reason, I want to show you a huge amount of numbers later on in the third lecture. There'll be slides. There's something else wrong. Uh, 13, I wrote, yes, this is a 3. Uh, I could claim that I meant to write a 3, but it, this is just a mistake. This is a 3. Thank you. Let me scan again while you observe. Now, what Zagier goes on to do in his letter is, and he describes his thought process, which is very interesting, is he's trying to figure out which primes in this table actually do arise and to what multiplicity they arise. 
And he kind of walks you through his thought process. He comes up with a formula, and then he proves it in, uh, in this letter. He proves the formula exactly. And this first exercise is to try and do the same. Because by doing it, I think you'll have really the right reflexes when we get to the real quadratic case. So I highly recommend uh, doing that particular exercise. So that's what happens in that letter. Now the rest is kind of history. Uh, because Zagier challenges Gross in the letter to find a proof that's different from his proof, because his proof uses, uh, it's a very analytic proof, it uses families of Eisenstein series. Uh, it revolves around the families of Eisenstein series that was written down by Hecker about 100 years ago. And he challenges Gross to find an algebraic proof, which Gross does. So they give two proofs in their first paper, and later on, they combine the two into the contributions at the Archimedean and the non-Archimedean primes to a height pairing of Hegner points. And these results, they led, let me just say, and I'll say more about this in the final lecture, to progress on the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. Relating the heights of Hegner points to the first derivative of the central value of the L function of an elliptic curve. So this is Gross Aguirre. Uh, 86, and then there's also Gross Conan's Aguirre. Eighty-seven. Yes, some question. Bigger, yes, thank you. Okay, so the goal, this course, We'll try to do a very similar kind of experiment and to try and construct also by analytic means, but piadic analytic means, invariants that look very similar to the differences of singular moduli uh, at two CM points, where we replace these two CM points by a pair of RM points, so uh, real quadratic fields instead of imaginary quadratic fields. And so this course will aim to discuss the foundations of this theory. So real quadratic analogs. And this is the, su the subject of rigid co-cycles. And everything that I'll mention is joint work with Harry Darmont. Okay. All right. Before we do that, uh, it's important to also mention that we're certainly not the first ones to try this, and there's very there's alternative approaches that I should mention. And that you may have heard of, but they yield a very different set of invariants. So other approaches have been explored. Of course, very famously, 